Now, as we get started with each one of these words, I want to remind you that we're, we are beginning with the end in mind and we're going to work backwards. This is most definitely a conversation that we're having, not a, a command. None of these things are coming down off a mountaintop. I just want you to kind of see behind the curtain of what God's putting on my heart as I think about the next 10 years of this church. Also know that this is descriptive of what God is showing me. It's not necessarily prescriptive. All of these things are just thoughts and things that I want you to be praying about as a church family. And some of what you hear each week, at least a portion of it, I bet, is going to stretch you just a little bit and make you think. So let's talk about legacy. And I want you to think for a minute, what is legacy? What, what is that? And how important is legacy in your life? What, is, what difference does it make what people say about you after you're, you're gone or you're, you're, you're off the clock or, or maybe you move to another place or there's a transition in your family? How important is this thought of legacy to you? I'm reminded as I think about this of the life of Rabbi Zachariah and, and folks like Johnny Hunt who have just recently, uh, their names have been brought out with scandal. These men that have spent their lives investing in people. And, you know, just, just one little piece of information can change the legacy and change the impression that people have of even some of the greatest leaders of our time. So here's a few thoughts. I want you to really think in, in, the tar- in, in, in the context of legacy in this first topic about life. That's really what we're talking about. What is the legacy of your life and how do you build a legacy that is something that you can look back on and say, man, I finished well. Now this word life has to do with eternal life, but it, all has, it also has to do with life right now. Like what are you doing? What are you into? What are you doing with your life to make an impact I heard someone say one time, it's really not what you do one day that makes your life great. It's what you do every day that makes your life great. What are the things that you're investing in that you're committed to? Now, here at First Baptist, in our fog, in our family of God, right here in this church family, we want to start with the, the idea of a large group of people worshiping together. Worship is the largest group. It is the, uh, the gathering of the body of Christ. When we gather for worship, always remember that the Bible teaches us that we don't gather for worship in discipleship mode or in evangelism mode. Worship really in the context of the local church. Ephesians 4, Paul says that we're to gather for equipping and training. So when we gather together, we're gathering to be equipped and to be trained. And then when we scatter out, we're scattering out into our various places of work and profession and and avocation and fun places and all of our family. We're scattering out for evangelism and and discipleship. So when we gather together, it's for training and equipping, Ephesians 4. And then when we scatter, it's for the missional aspects of making disciples and sharing Christ through evangelism. This is the larger group that when we come together to edify, to build up, and to just lift our praises vertically to God as we gather together. Now, the more concentrated group of this when it comes to relational power is the smaller group that you're in, a connection group, a discipleship group, a term group. We have all kinds of groups here that meet. And a long legacy of Sunday school at our church, which is basically just group ministry. So this is the place where you really get cared for and you get connected. This is a place where discipleship can happen, but in these groups, we also want to make sure that there's something that's relational that's happening here, life on life, a place where you can tell your story, where you can know someone else's story, where you're staying connected. And this, by the way, this this group mentality happens best in circles and not in rows. It's not necessarily a teaching environment. This is more of a connection place. It's a a life-on-life discipleship, iron sharpening iron, all the different things that the Scripture says. So part of that is instruction, absolutely, but that's not all it is. And that's why we need to make sure that we're face-to-face, heart-to-heart, connecting life-on-life. And then the, the most central version of this is really your own family. And this is one thing that I think we've left out in recent history in our church in America. Is we, we've forgotten that the family is the source, it's the unit in which the church is built. We are a family of families when we come together as the church. The family is the centerpiece. God established the first family when he decided it wasn't good for Adam to be alone and, and Eve came on the scene. So Family is important to God. Family is important to us. It's, it's something that is uh, uh, too easily neglected, you know, especially I remember when I was a youth pastor having parents come in and holding me accountable to do all the discipleship and all the Christian education and all the spiritual formations for their child. And I saw them maybe an hour or two a week. 
Whereas they were spending hours and hours and hours in school and hours and hours and hours at home with their family. The family unit is where discipleship happens best. And there's all different types of family structures, all different shapes and sizes. But I can tell you one thing, every family is better with the church family, as I said earlier. Now, what does it look like when we gather together? This should be like this multi-generational expression. And this is what really came to mind when I was thinking about this. Uh, for the context of family mud. I want a place where our children and our grandchildren can stay connected and engaged with our church family in every season of life. I don't want there to be any reason for a child or grandchild or a great-grandchild not to come to our church. Now, what that's going to require, what we're already in the, <laughs> in the rhythm of doing, is beginning to look at our church not through the lens of grandpa, grandma, but look through the lens of the eyes of the future, the folks that are coming up in our ranks You know, when I first came here in 2016, if I'm being honest, we were very heavy on senior adults, but we've been trending younger. Just in that picture I showed you of uh, our first gathering on Sunday nights to have these conversations, there were folks in their 20s, there were folks in their 30s, there were teenagers, there were kids. It was just a whole expression of people coming in different age groups, all the way up to the 90s, in fact. They had someone in their 90s that was there. So we were able to just really see the full breadth of this multi-generational work that God does when he puts a family of God together. I'm really not into the churches that focus on a specific age group, whether it be an older group or a younger group. I don't see any biblical support for that anywhere. In fact, I think we're better when we're together because we learn the lessons from the different generations of the spiritual journey that we're on. And it does say in the scripture that the older men are to teach the younger men and the older women are to teach the younger women. And that's really hard to do if you don't have both in the same place. It just isn't going to happen. There's certain expressions of the spiritual beauty of the church that you'll never experience unless you're in a multi-generational church by design. But it means we have to change our filters. It means that we have to, um, you know, really celebrate when we have rows of youth in our church. I love seeing that. But we also have to acknowledge that, listen, it's hard to do this because This phrase that I heard recently probably brings this forward in a visual way. Someone said to me recently that it's hard for young trees to grow under large oaks. If you just think about that for a minute, a small little tree growing under this huge oak, all the leaves and the the branches and everything blocking the sunlight, blocking the, the water to come down, and the roots being in competition with this big oak's roots. So I think it's the job of the large oak tree to make some room, to maybe prune back or pull back some things, some space so the light can come in, so that the pathways toward leadership and spiritual formation can happen in the context of local church, making uh, opportunities for younger folks to step into positions of leadership, even if it's a little bit messy. It's the same thing that John the Baptist did when, when he said, I must decrease so that he can increase. This is the kind of work that needs to happen in our church. And that's going to become, <laughs> in front of our own eyes, it already is, an imperfect and a messy church. But it's going to be a place where our grandkids love inviting their friends. So we need a growing church. And a growing church is going to be a messy church. That's messy in our finances. That's messy in our facilities. You know, all of it has to be up for grabs when it comes to being a little messy. You know, my first church that I I served in up in the South Charlotte area, they had two really ongoing complaints that were kind of in competition with each other. Let me show you with you what they were. There was one complaint that I heard, and I was the youth pastor at my first church for a while, and the complaint went something like this. We need more youth. We need to get more youth in our church. The other future, we need to get more youth in the church. And I would hear this. And so we'd work on that and we'd get more youth in the church and kids would come to the church and all of a sudden they didn't look like everybody in the church. They didn't act like everybody in the church. And every once in a while they brought a drink into the sanctuary or spilled something or broke something, you know, or we had a lock-in and maybe somebody, uh, you know, moved something and didn't put it back. It was messy all the time when we had like kids. So then that brought up the second complaint. Man, there's, these youth sure are making a mess. You need to get them in line. Now, the problem with that is if, you're not, if you don't lead with love, what winds up having is instead of getting this place, <laughs> getting the kids in a place where they're respectful, they just leave. This is a different situation we live in today. Not all kids are brought up the same way that maybe I was these days. So, look, it's going to be messy. It's going to be imperfect. But it needs to be the type of place that kids and grandkids love and not only coming but inviting their friends to because they're having such a good time. A real practical thing that I want to show you is just the idea of putting our family story on the walls of our church. I think that would be so good to just have pictures of things that are happening in our church and with the people, specifically the faces of the people in our church, up on the walls. If you go down to our student center right now, you'll see some images of this on the walls as you just walk into the student center. They're already ahead of 
uh, the adults. I love the fact that our youth are leading us in that. And our student ministry is, is definitely growing. But I'd, I'd love to see that across our entire campus, pictures. So instead of having just plain walls with paint on them, like we have beautiful places in our sanctuary lobby and around the halls of our connection groups and all over our campus where we could feature what our church is really about, and that's the people, bringing that forward. I'd love to bring our campus to life that way and highlight our history and just highlight our highlights, like what's going on. Another thing that's been on my heart in the lane of legacy is prioritizing our legacy by planting seeds of health. That's an important phrase. Seeds of health for the next generation. Now, what are seeds of health, you ask? Well, I think at our church, one of the ones that I want to focus on a lot is just decision-making pathways. If I'm honest with you, a lot of times we make decisions here and the process is clunky and it's too slow. We've got to have a faster reaction pattern for making decisions and uh, clarifying how that happens. And that has to happen in the context of another seed of health, which is installing servant leadership into our church. Not just our deacons who are servant leaders, but everyone having this attitude of servant leadership. Another seed of health that I see, a third one, is just the, the power of the Holy Spirit being embraced. Not being afraid of conversations about the power of the Holy Spirit. Really leaning into the movement of God through the Holy Spirit. Knowing Him and seeing His power expressed, inviting Him. And then the, the last one that's on my mind is probably the most important, and it's the idea of prayer. A seed of health for our church is activating prayer. Now, I've heard recently something that kind of changed my thinking on this. For a long time, almost the whole time I've been your pastor here, I've, I've said the phrase that we're, a, described our church as a church that prays, a church that prays. And I want to swap that up a little bit based on a conversation I had with a gentleman. He said, Cutchins, he said, if you're saying a church that prays, I want to challenge you to say instead that you're a praying church. Instead of a church that prays, you're a praying church. Get the praying on the front end. And it reminded me of when I was at Winthrop University. I was a, an education major, and I took a class that was specifically designed to help teachers understand how to deal with, with kids that had special needs. And one of the most memorable things that happened in that class was with, with one of the students, it was a friend of mine, who said to the teacher something about a situation that they were dealing with, and they used the phrase, a disabled child. And the teacher was very quick, the professor was very quick to, to stop that colleague of mine, that classmate of mine, and say, look, that's not how we deal with this in our language. You don't say disabled child or handicapped child. You always start with a child. This is a child with a handicap, a child with a disability. It's not, their persona is not built into their their, their, their special need. Their persona is as a human being and as a child who is dealing with this certain thing. So the priority was on the person instead of the disability. And that really has helped my thinking with this conversation with the gentleman recently about prayer. I think that it's important for us in this seeds of health thing to make sure that we're not just a church that prays, but that we are an ongoing, active, um, praying church that is committed to unceasing prayer. And that's going to be one of the challenges you're going to hear about in one of the other sections. We'll come back to it. The other thing that's really important to me is, man, we are almost out of debt. As I'm sitting here recording this right now, we are on target to be out of debt for the first time since the late 1980s. Uh, well, I mean, just within the next six to nine months. I'm excited about that. But I think we also need to, as we move forward, make a commitment to contribute before we actually spend. So the contributions that we make are not just of money, by the way. It's our time, our money, and our talent is what I'm talking about. So in our time, we have a lot of time that we ask for specifically from our volunteers and our servant leaders at our church. We have hundreds, hundreds. I think there's over 400 people that volunteer currently at our church. That's a lot of folks that are spending time making this thing happen and serving other people. But there's also the money aspect of it. I mean, just quite frankly, we don't know what the future holds in our current environment here in our country. We have a lot of protections as a 501c3. And, you know, just the idea of having to pay even property taxes on this size facility could be debilitating to us financially. So we need to begin to think forward and, and have some protective things in, in mind so that we are contributing to not only the, the projects, but to the protection of this church family as we move into the future. And another piece of it is just, quite frankly, talent. There's a real shift that's happening out there in church staffing 
that is requiring us to get very creative and get back to the basics on how we have leadership pipelines. Uh, gone are the days where we can just go out and hire whoever we want to from some other place. There is a, a professional uh, gap right now between the needs of the churches for staff and the actual people that are committed and ready and prepared to jump into those positions at churches. So we need a leadership pipeline where we're developing people in-house to serve in our church. And the last couple are probably the ones that are going to stretch us this, the most and may be really a 10-year conversation. You know, for the last five years, we've had elders at our church that have served as an extension of my office to help me with blind spots. They've been a huge benefit to me, men that meet with me about eight or nine times a year, about seven of them. That we all meet together and, and talk and pray and, um, you know, it's been a great help. But other than being a part of my office as the senior pastor, the elders don't have an official place in our governance or any other place in our leadership structure. They're not even mentioned anywhere in our guiding documents. So I think we need to establish a biblical leadership structure. Look, you can't go very far in any of the New Testament books, especially the book of Acts, without hearing that Paul established elders at every church, every church he went to, elders, elders, elders. There's a specific role that's missing in a lot of Southern Baptist churches. Now, what I'm not saying is I'm not saying that we should go in and uh, adjust our bylaws or our guiding documents in a way that takes um, us in a direction that's counterintuitive to our heritage. We have, from our inception, been a congregationally ruled church, self-autonomous. The congregation rules and that they vote on who their leaders are and how we spend money. And I'm a part of that congregation, so we do that together on an annual basis with our, our budgeting process. The rule of those decision-making should, in my opinion, continue to stay in the lane of a congregational environment. But the elders do need to have some rules. So when we talk about, again, this is a consideration, we should consider how do we adjust the bylaws and the guiding documents of our church just to acknowledge the fact that we have elders and just clearly identify what they're doing and what we'd like for them to do. You know, the deacons here are very clearly defined with a deacon handbook. They, they, they lead our church by serving our church. Diakonos is the Greek word for deacon. And then the elders should be serving the church, but they serve the church by actually leading and providing spiritual direction. The other thing that this will allow us to do is begin to protect the church from disruptive leadership transitions by creating a clear and biblical succession plan that includes the elders of the church praying through and providing uh, you know, encouragement and direction on how leaders should be developed and placed into the different roles. Now, we have committees here. We have um, uh, deacons. We have um, you know, staff members. Uh, a lot of these are pretty smooth and have clear guidelines, but they happen sometimes in, in isolation from each other and almost in siloed little conversations where different leaders are being put in different places, even with our volunteer groups. But we're doing a pretty good job. I think the one that's the most concerning to me, the one that's been the most difficult for our church, if we're being honest, is the uh, senior pastor transitions. The last three have been bumpy. They've been bumpy. I've only been here for one of the last three senior pastor transitions, but I can tell you in that one, I felt all three of them coming back up. A lot of pain and hurt. Uh, this is where churches all across our nation are failing. So don't feel like you're alone. Transitions of leadership and biblical succession plans are things that we usually wait to think about until it's already happening. And I would suggest that that's not the time when you want to be making those decisions. It's kind of like when you tell someone you need to start a banking uh, savings account in their bank and they wait until they lose their job to start their savings account. Let me tell you, like when you lose your job, that's not the time to go start a savings account. You should have already done that and already been ready for that uh, bad news that you lost your job. And it's the same thing with leadership succession. You need to be thinking ahead about who's going to be taking the places of people and who are we growing for all the different positions internally. I see this, by the way, as a, a, a plague of a problem in local churches around us. In our church, it's been an issue. And just in the consulting I do with churches across the nation, it's, it is a real crisis out there, the staffing and the leadership crisis. So the elders will never rule here. I don't see our church moving in that direction. But I do think the elders need to be acknowledged, especially after five years of service. <clears throat> Those men that started with me committed to five to eight years, and I'll be, uh, you know, prayerfully thinking through how we want to uh, include them. But it's, just, it's something that we need to think through. And again, the congregation needs to have full authority over how that happens and if that happens. But it's something to think about. So legacy. 
want you to think about what stood out to you as we had this conversation about legacy. Uh, what was the thing that sparked your interest the most? And again, you can send me an email or reach out to me and a lot of different ways to get connected with me. The ask anything at csrechurch.org is an email where you can send something directly to me. But let me encourage you to be a praying member of our church family. Not just a member of our church family that prays, but to be a praying member of our church family. And uh, be praying with me as we think through all these different things. And again, next week, we'll come back to this. We'll look a little bit more at this, but our target next week is that next word. And it's the word vision, working from the, the end toward the beginning of that statement that we value families by investing in a vision of legacy. Mm-hmm.